The wild, wild west of big pet food has done it again. We're going to break down what the deal is with rice, feeding rice to our dogs, and is rosemary oil really bad for our pets? Mm, we're going to talk about it all in today's episode of the Pet Parenting Reset. <coughs> Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Welcome back. This is a new segment that I call the weekly wrap up where I find some of the most interesting news stories in the pet world and break them all down for you. So we're going to be talking about so much today. First of all, the craziness that is big pet food, breaking it all down with rice for dogs and Hmm, rosemary oil. Is it actually bad? Is it causing seizures in our dogs? Ooh, let's find out. Well, I never want to bury the lead, so let's get right into the craziness going on in the wild, wild west that we know as big pet food. I call it the wild, wild west because it seems like they have, well, they have lots of rules and regulations, but Nobody holds them accountable. So <laughs> we're going back to the truth about pet food and Su that's Susan Thixton's blog. I, I think it is the absolute best blog to find out what's actually going on in the world of big pet food. And let's see, this is published April 25th by Susan Thixton. Dog DNA found in two dog foods. Oof. All six pet foods analyzed contain multiple ingredients not listed on the label. Oh my gracious, yes. The nightmare has once again proven to be true, Susan starts out. Dog DNA was found in two pet foods, along with a long list of other ingredients not disclosed by the manufacturer. Oh boy, who the thunk it? Well, those of us in the know and who are pretty big critics of what they're doing with big pet food these days... Well, we're not really batting much of an eye at this, are we? Because we kind of expect the worst at this point, which is really sad. I don't mean to come off as cynical, but the reality is when you spend your life, like I do, uh, diving into what is actually going on, what is causing all of these issues in our pets, what is happening in our pets when they're eating this highly processed, rendered product that they call pet food? Well, it's easy to become cynical, but the reality is this is, this is devastating news. In my opinion, I actually trained, did some dog training at uh, someone's home in my neighborhood. Gosh, this was in maybe January of this year, if I'm remembering correctly. Time escapes me, but um, I think time escapes a lot of us ever since the pandemic. Wouldn't wouldn't we all agree on that? <laughs> it's a crazy thing. But um, she had at one point fed Rachel Ray dog food to her dog. At the time, she didn't, but it was something that she had she used to feed. And I was like, oh yeah, because they found dog DNA in it. And she was like, wait, what? That wasn't the reason she had stopped feeding it. The dog just stopped eating it. And uh, so she switched to something else and she had absolutely no idea. So the reality for, I think, the majority of people, not only in the U.S., but probably across the world, I don't know, I'm in the U.S., so that's kind of how I gauge things. Um, we just don't hear, like, this isn't headline news, so we don't hear about it. And, uh, you know... I think it's important for us to know what's going on and what is in our pet's food. Even if we take away the processing of the food, even if we take away the poor quality of the ingredients used in the food, even if we took all of that away, being able to read, understand, and understand, decipher what is in that bag of food, 
read the ingredient label and be able to understand what that is, what is in that bag of food, and have some semblance of confidence as to it being accurate. Well, that's pretty darn important, especially when today, like we're in, I'm, the day I'm recording this, April 26, 2023, we have the most insane number of dogs with, I would be willing to venture that at this point, it's a vast majority of dogs that have some form of illness, whether it's cancer, well, hello, dogs over 10 years of age, we're looking at over 50%, um, heart disease, skin issues, which are generally related to gut health. Um, sometimes when we're really lucky, it's it literally is just environmental allergies, but oftentimes, very often, it's related to the food that we're feeding causing dysbiosis in the gut, causing what we know as leaky gut, causing autoimmune attacks on the food, causing skin and ear and paw issues. So we are living in a time where <laughs> it is vitally important that we all understand that what we put in is what we get out. So we need to be able to understand what it is that we're putting in. So I'm going back to Susan Thixton's article. Uh, research did not provide the brand names of the pet foods tested. Um, this was a publication uh, by in January of 2023 by the American Chemical Society. It says, and I'm quoting, our test detected DNA of undeclared ingredients in all tested pet food samples, entailing improvements of regulation and quality control in American pet food industry. One of those undeclared ingredients discovered in the dog food ana analyzed was dog. Dog DNA was found in two of the six pet foods tested. Two of the six. One third of the tested samples had dog DNA in it. Now, <laughs> that's pretty darn troubling for me. You can make up your own mind. I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'm just bringing the information to you. This is the third time in four years dog food has tested positive for dog DNA. The first evidence of this horror was DNA analysis included in a lawsuit against Rachel Ray Nutrish dog food. Everything but the kitchen sink being in these products. So I will make sure to put the link to this blog post on truthaboutpetfood.com uh, written by Susan Thixton in the show notes of today's podcast episode. And we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we are talking about, we are digging deep and talking dirty uh, about rice for dogs. And don't forget, coming up, is rosemary oil causing seizures in our dogs. Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. Welcome back. We are diving deep into rice for dogs. And this is actually a post that I found that Dr. Kathy Allen Novi, she is a veterinarian, um, a holistic health veterinarian and author. And she's pretty popular in the pet world. If you haven't heard of her, she is a veterinarian, of course. And she put up a blog post this week about rice. And I am, I'm just, I'm just going to read it at least some of this to you, because she's talking about rice and really kind of throwing some shade <laughs> at her peers, uh, veterinarians. Um, and I, for the absolute most part, 
completely agree with her. Of course, she is an incredible holistic veterinarian. So why would I disagree with her? But I do have one little snippet to add on to the end uh, of this particular segment. So make sure to stay tuned for that. So she says, even conventional veterinarians who are adamantly opposed to people, people food, um, they'll tell you to feed chicken and rice if your dog has a sensitive stomach or diarrhea or something like that. What is my problem? She says, there are three aspects that I feel should also be covered first. Rice is definitely bland for us humans. Remember that brat diet thing they always talk about? Banana, rice, applesauce, and toast. That's kind of what we as humans are told. When you have an upset stomach, revert to the brat diet. So yeah, if we have the flu, we're supposed to eat these bland foods. That is a concept for humans, she says. So why is it, do you think, that mm, it's not going to work for dogs and cats? Humans produce a lot of amylase. Now, I feel like I have talked about this. Mm, maybe not on the podcast before, but certainly on my blog, on YouTube, um, specifically as it relates to carbohydrate and grain, grain carbohydrate, when we're referring to feeding dogs and cats a species appropriate diet. So let's get into the, the down and dirty of amylase. If you've not heard of this, amylase is a digestive enzyme that breaks down carbohydrates, specifically in this case, rice. Dogs and cats have very little amylase by comparison to humans. And if their intestines are messed up, dogs and cats have even less amylase. So if you feed them rice and their guts are all screwed up, you're likely to make things even worse. So here's uh, amylase is a digestive enzyme, as uh, Dr. Kathy Alanovi's blog post is stating. I'm sorry, this isn't a blog post. This is a post she put up on Facebook, which I will also link in the show notes. The fact is that cats do not produce amylase. Dogs, uh, humans, as humans, we actually produce am amylase in our saliva. So as we are ingesting uh, starchy carby carbohydrate foods, we can start to break that down with our saliva as it enters our mouth, which is the beginning of our digestive system. Uh, cats do not produce amylase. Dogs do not produce amylase in the saliva over time because dogs have evolved alongside of us for thousands of years. Their pancreas has started to produce some amylase to help in digestion with the inevitable, inevitable carbohydrate they would uh, be getting because they... Uh, uh, you know, living alongside of us for thousands of years have eaten a lot of the same things we have eaten in scrap form, right? Um, that's kind of the, the symbiotic relationship that humans and dogs have had for many thousands of years is that they get scraps left over uh, from what we eat. So just evolutionarily, they have evolved to where their pancreas has started to produce some amounts of amylase. And that is kind of a key important uh, thing to know as we continue this post that Dr. Kathy Alanovi posted. So when, uh, back to her post, so when we're talking general dietary distress and look at the chicken and rice concept, I would argue that it's more appropriate to feed chicken only, unless of course the dog or cat is sensitive to chicken. What do we use rice for? Me personally, I think it makes my sushi rolls taste absolutely fabulous. <laughs> funny, funny, funny. My husband is such a foodie. We eat lots of Asian foods, um, particularly sushi. He loves sushi and he loves making his own sushi, sushi at home. Lucky me. And um, really the interesting part about sushi rice is not just the rice, but the, um, uh, so because I'm not a foodie, I don't know the real word, but I'm lack of a better word. I'm going to say the sauce they put on the rice. It's like this mixture of rice wine vinegar and sugar. And I don't know what else my husband makes that I do not, but that's what you kind of have to fold into the rice. Um, as it starts to cool down to kind of give it that sushi rice flavor. Anyway, Side note, not important to the story, but you might find it interesting. So um, we can try to argue that there is nutritional value in rice, but let's be real. It's primarily a very cheap filler, AKA a source of carbohydrates. Carbohydrates turn into sugar. Excess sugar is stored as fat. Rice makes us fat. 
Now here's my pet peeve. To explain this, I'm going to give a short science lesson. By the way, every veterinarian, physician, nurse, chiropractor, healthcare professional learns this information the very first year of medical training. Maybe they forgot. <laughs> She's funny. I like her. Okay, food is primarily made up of protein, fat, and carbohydrate. Sure, there's a little bit of vitamins and minerals, but it's mostly protein, fat, and carbohydrate. So we eat our food. It goes into the stomach. A well-functioning stomach has high levels of acid. The acid breaks protein down into tiny little pieces called amino acids. The amino acids are absorbed by the body and turned back into muscle, like, you know, muscle, or the heart, because the heart is a muscle. Next, the food goes into the small intestines. The duct from the gallbladder is right across the intestinal street from the duct from the pancreas. The gallbladder contains bile. Bile breaks down fat. So what's left? That's right, carbohydrates. The primary job of the pancreas is to digest carbohydrates, not fat, not proteins. Sure, the pancreas has a small function of digesting fat and protein. The primary job of the pancreas is to digest carbohydrates. So if a dog has an upset stomach, it's always possible that it has pissed off the pancreas. If there's any possibility at all that the dog has pissed off, uh, has a pissed off pancreas, why in the world would we feed rice, which makes the pancreas even more pissed off? Now you're probably asking yourself why in the world your veterinarian told you that pancreatitis was a fat problem. Oh my gracious. Now we get to the part where this is what I wanted to tell you about. It, this isn't really about rice, you guys. It is, but it isn't. This is the part that I wanted you to hear. Now you're probably asking yourself why in the world your veterinarian told you that pancreatitis was a fat problem. It's a beautiful question, Dr. Kathy Alanovi says. There is a blood test to evaluate the function of the pancreas. It measures pancreatic lipase. Lipase is an enzyme that digests fat, aka lipid. So if the pancreatic lipase is high, the dog has pancreatitis. But it doesn't mean the illness is a lipid or fat issue. It means, it just means, the lipase is high. But we absolutely need to stop feeding freaking carbohydrates because the primary enzyme made the pancreas is amylase. Why are 99.7% of veterinarians, I have no idea where she got that percentage, but it's probably pretty accurate. Why are 99.7% of veterinarians continuing to tell people that their dog has pancreatitis and absolutely must avoid fat marketing? Pure and simple. It's the pet food companies teaching the veterinarians that it's a fat problem. And it's a matter of forgetting the first year of veterinary school. I kid you not. Every single veterinary student learns in physiology class, first year of vet school, the primary function of the pancreas is carbohydrate metabolism. So please skip the rice. It's a cheap filler, has very little nutritional benefit, and could be making things worse, especially in dogs with pancreatitis. Woo! Thank you, Dr. Kathy Alanovi. Um, I did tell you that I have a little tidbit that I'm going to add on to this little rice debacle. And I am going to do that as well as talk to you about rosemary oil as soon as we get back. Today's episode is brought to you by the Furry Family Coach Dog Training. Train your dog in the comfort of your own home and on your schedule with a video instruction from me. Learn the foundations of training, teach basic cues to your dog, and explore solutions to behavioral issues all inside of this video-based online training course. Go to thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. That's thefurryfamilycoach.com and use code podcast at checkout to get your first month for only $7. I can't wait to see you on the inside. Okay, so we are back and my one little caveat, first of all, beautiful post beautiful post by Dr. Kathy Alanovi because I think we as pet parents have just been given so much incorrect information about pancreatitis in general, <laughs> just in general, that it's really important for people like Dr. Kathy Alanovi to be putting real information, like true, accurate information out in the world for pet parents like yourself to absorb and kind of keep tucked away in the back of your mind. So you're probably wondering now, what in the world should I be feeding my dog if not chicken and rice, <laughs> right? Uh, when they have an upset stomach. Well, the very first thing I think um, is 
if there is blood coming out, you need to go to the veterinarian. Like that is something that I just want to throw in there. If vomiting and or diarrhea persists for more than a couple of days, go to the veterinarian. But if this is just something that like, oh man, my dog's tummy seems a little bit upset today. No, like no big deal, but I want to kind of help them through this. Uh, one, we could fast for a good 12 hours to help to just give the digestive system time to settle. And then to feed a bland diet, we can do cooked ground turkey and cooked sweet potato, a little bit of sweet potato, or just the cooked ground turkey. Um, that's kind of my go-to. Just so you know, just so you have that information in the back of your uh, in the back of your mind, and that sweet potato really is like a fiber to help firm up the poop. I also really like adding a little bit of chia seed in there to help um, unsoaked chia seed to help absorb the excess liquid as it goes through the system. So uh, I also had I told you one little tidbit to add on, and that is the fact that brown rice is what we call a resistant starch. And a resistant starch is something that we can see help some animals with IBD because a resistant starch is actually a starch that does not break down into sugar in the body. So very interesting. There are very few of these. Lentils are one. A green banana is another potatoes or another that, but just kind of, so, you know, I don't want to completely 100% demonize all rice for all dogs. Understand that this is any and everything I talk about is a very individual, like we need to look at our pets as individuals and any time we make decisions, it needs to be based on their individual need at that time. So that's kind of why I wanted to throw that in there for you, just to let you know I'm not completely demonizing rice here. So let's see. Oh, I got this blog uh, blog post this week uh, in an email from Four Legger. Now, you probably know I'm a huge fan of Four Legger shampoo. Um, I use Four Legger shampoo for my dog, specifically the unscented uh, one, because then I can take my Animalio essential oils and mix it with the four legger unscented shampoo, which is a completely clean shampoo. Um, it doesn't have any chemicals or anything like that in it. And again, no fragrance because I get the unscented one. And then I can use whatever essential oil or essential oil blend that my dog needs at the time. More often than not, I'm using um, either evict or away or oust. Those are the three, uh, pest control <laughs> essential oil blends that Dr. Shelton has, uh, over at Animalio. And that is honestly even something that I use out of season just because I absolutely love the way it smells. But let's talk about rosemary essential oil. Apparently there are still people out there and probably rightfully so you know we should have some skepticism in our lives that's how we learn and grow is by asking questions and we ask questions because we are skeptical and so i don't again demonize skepticism i think we should be asking questions so does rosemary essential oil trigger seizures so apparently a customer contacted them. They had concerns about the use of rosemary essential oil in some of the shampoos because her dog has a seizure condition and sent a couple of articles as to why she was concerned. So apparently there was a study done in 2009. It was the first study. Um, uh, she says the first study was a single instance of a man who had a temporal lobectomy as a treatment for his epilepsy. This type of treatment may be done when medication is unable to control seizures. While on a cruise ship, he had an herbal massage. Later, during the night, he had a breakthrough epileptic seizure after being seizure-free for eight years. The article noted that the camphor content in the rosemary may have been a trigger for the breakthrough seizure. The ingredients of the product, which the uh, herbal massage oil, whatever it was, uh, are listed for reference, and there are a ton, a ton of ingredients in this product. As a scientist, she says, looking at the list of ingredients, I don't see how you could possibly single out one ingredient, i.e. rosemary, and say something within that ingredient triggered the seizure. Seizures can be triggered by any number of 
and combination of environmental, metabolic, and ingredient factors, including the following, being overly tired, overstimulated, or busy, illness, flashing or bright lights, alcohol, stress, hormonal changes, not eating well, dehydration, low blood sugar, and it goes on and on and on. Um, there was another study done in 2019, uh, which was a study review of essential oils and their role in controlling or triggering seizures. Bottom line, the essential oil constituent exposures presented in the article are extreme and not typical in everyday use or exposure. So what do I do anytime I have a question about essential oils? Well, I pull up my handy dandy ADR, the Animal Desk Reference Second Edition, Essential Oils for Animals. This is the reference <laughs> for any and everything you could possibly ever want to know, scientifically backed and proven, um, written by Dr. Melissa Shelton. So it says, and there's a lot in here that it says about rosemary essential oil, but I will just kind of paraphrase a few things. Rosemary oil has many benefits in the world of animals. It has GRAS status and has been used in French hospitals to disinfect the air and as part of the blends we use for this purpose in our veterinary hospital. We see vast reduction in transmission of upper respiratory infections and kennel cough when blends containing this oil are diffused on a regular basis in shelters, hospitals, grooming facilities, boarding facilities, or any other location where multiple animals will be in contact. Rosemary as a single oil has been noted to have bug repelling properties and seems especially good at repelling Asian beetles and box elder bugs that invade our homes. Through the diffusion of rosemary itself, we have noted continually less of these bugs that are entering our home and clinic. There's a lot of interesting research regarding rosemary and even studies that show that tracheal muscle contractions due to inflammation and irritants were lessened through exposure to the essential oil and it goes on and on and on. Uh, the last urban legend that arises with rosemary are the many reports to be cautious regarding seizures or epilepsy with rosemary exposure or use. I even see humans wishing to avoid rosemary extract, a natural preservative, within foods and shampoos. The link to rosemary and seizures comes from the possible high camphor content, especially related to the camphor chem chemotype of rosemary. 1,8-cineol is also often incriminated for seizure potential. It is the overexposure to these constituents and often by themselves that we should be concerned with, not the rosemary as a whole. So what does that mean, really, <laughs> in layman terms? Pretty much exactly the same thing that I have been saying for I don't know how long nature provides, right? Rosemary the way it exists in nature is incredible and has many benefits to us as humans and to animals in the world. It exists for a reason and there are many beautiful, wonderful uses for it, probably many that we don't even know yet. It is when we as humans think we are all knowing and all powerful and we pull pieces and parts out of it and try to use those pieces and parts out of it uh, whether they are the natural derivatives or chemical compounds made to uh, imitate those uh, natural derivatives, that we really can run into problems. So don't demonize the rosemary plant. It's absolutely incredible and wonderful and has many, many uh, potentials for helping us and our pets. Uh, if anything at all, demonize the companies that are using derivatives and not the whole component. Though, I don't know, is demonize the right word? Not really, but I think you get my point. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me today. Uh, I hope this was a interesting episode. It's something I definitely haven't done before, but I'm kind of liking the format of it to just bring you news and updates in the pet world. Let me know if you like this type of episode, and we will definitely be doing more of them as long as you like them. So with that, please give your pets some extra love from me this week. Until next week, have a great day. Oh, oh.